In part 5 of Bargain Racement, we took our little Citroen C1 race car to Cadwell Park for the inaugural City Car Cup event. It went quite well, and we ended up on the podium in second place. The car ran perfectly all day and didn't miss a beat. The only marks added were the remains of some unfortunate insects splattered across the bumper, along with a liberal sprinkling of brake dust covering the front wheels. Before we started, if you'd have offered a second place at a track I'd never been to before and a car I'd barely driven, I'd have probably been pretty happy. That happiness, of course, is very short-lived when you realise that second place is just another way of saying first loser. There's no problem in coming second when you've had a race-long battle and been beaten by the better driver. That's, um, that's not what happened, though, is it? Well, no, not quite. We got spanked. Our deficit in qualifying was a colossal 1.8 seconds. That's a lifetime in racing terms. Some of the missing pace was down to the driver due to a lack of seat time, and there really is no substitute for it. After some more seat time in the race, I'd managed to trim the difference in fastest laps between Nick Grindrod and I to just a hair over a second. Having more confidence in the car and the circuit helps enormously. That does not, however, account for the majority of the deficit, which must mean we're missing something in the setup of the car. So this has just become my problem now, has it? Figures. Before we go too crazy with any drastic alterations, it's worth checking that there's nothing fundamentally wrong with the car. Putting the strings on it to check the alignment is the first thing we'll have a look at. It's certainly possible that I clacked a curb and sent the tracking out, causing some scrub and therefore some speed loss, but no, the car's alignment was spot on. We'll have to look somewhere else. That somewhere else is underneath the car for the most part. One of the most important maintenance jobs on a race car is the spanner check. And to do that, I need the car on the stands. She's down that side. Mm -hmm. First thing I do is have a good nose about with the torch to make sure nothing obvious is hanging off. Grab things and give them a wiggle. It'll soon become apparent if anything is loose. The last part of this process is to whip out the show spanners and give every bolt and nut some damn good welly. The only thing I did notice while underneath was that the front tyres had been rubbing on the arch lip. So to remove the chance of a puncture, we'll bend those returns flat against the inside of the arch with a hammer. But with nothing obviously untoward with the car, we'll have to look elsewhere for an injection of pace. We've only really exploited the full technical areas of the regulations. And it's pretty much got us nowhere, so as a race engineer it is my job, no it's my duty, to reread those regulations much more carefully and see if there's any performance to be gained from the murkier grey areas. Most regulations in tightly controlled classes have a clause like this one from a Civic Cup, which states that unless we say you can do something, you can't. However, our regulations were written by poacher turned gamekeeper Greg, who omitted it. This, of course, was a mistake, because it's the first thing I look for. I wonder what Nick's opening gambit will be. So, the roll cage. In essence, we're carrying around a bunch of scaffolding just in case Richard decides to put the car on its roof. If it was up to me, I'd run without it because it would be a lot lighter. Still, it's not, so it's got to be there. There's a lot of weight to be lugging around, just doing the one job. Our cage is bolted to the shell in just six places, all of which are basically in the same plane, i.e. the floor. So with no other attachment places, all that lovely tubing offers absolutely nothing in terms of increased chassis stiffness. This roll cage is actually better than most due to the design of the door bars and the double diagonal. But I want to do what I would normally do with a six-point cage, which is weld in a load of extra gussets, making it a multi-point cage and stiffening up the chassis. Mate, our rules specifically state no roll cage modification at all, and absolutely no welding whatsoever to any part of the body shell. So nice try, but that's the end of that. Is it? Is it really? Oh, God. Grinder? This looks like the perfect opportunity for a fabrication montage. So, once again, it's time for me to get the funk out.
we are expressly forbidden to weld anything to or modify the body shell in any way, but this bolt hole here was far too tempting for us to ignore. It held the seat belt up originally, so is reinforced and extra strong. So it occurred to us that a pair of Nick's speciality brackets fixed to those holes using the original 1738th UNZ bolt and then projecting back to the main hoop where the whole thing is then fastened to the cage leg using two hoofing great big aluminium clamps. Now, we haven't modified anything at all. We're using existing anchor points on the shell to increase the effectiveness of the roll cage. You could argue that the car is now safer than it was before we added the brackets. Along the roof line is this existing M6 threaded hole in the shell. And here's another on the A post. They look ripe for conversion into an anchor point for the modified exhaust clamps Nick made earlier on. These clamps are situated in such a way that they should offer some extra rigidity to the shell around the colossal door aperture. They sit either side of the cage's screen rail, so they might tighten up that area a little too. They're only M6 fasteners, so they ain't going to do a whole lot, but the four of them together, along with the two big brackets tying in the main hoop, should make the shell demonstrably stiffer. Let's see if we can show you if it's made a difference. Before the brackets went on, we put a torch behind the front tyre and lifted it at the rear jacking point. We counted the number of pumps it took to get the front tyre off the ground. And in this case, it was about nine and a half. Let's see what happens after the brackets were installed. So one, two, three, four, five, six, not six. So by using science, we can say that the shell is now nearly four stiffer. We're not expecting the extra stiffness to gain us any lap time at all, just a more stable base for any setup changes. But we need an accurate way of monitoring whether any setup changes we do try make a difference. So we've nicked this Link Dash system that was destined for the rally car, and I'm going to install it in the Citroen. It's a fair weapon, and comes with all mod cons, including a GPS sensor for showing lap times and speed. Now, we're not allowed to modify the wiring loom in any way, so I found a Toyota to ISO radio adapter, wired the new dash's loom into the adapter, and plugged it straight into the original wiring. The dash will take a feed via a CAN bus to an aftermarket ECU for monitoring engine parameters, but in our case, we just have to plug it into the OBD2 port. It really is that simple. I made a little bracket for the GPS sensor to sit on, and I've mounted it where the speaker used to go. Just to keep things neat and tidy, the grill goes back on for the stealthy look. Yes, it works just fine with a cover on, in case you're wondering. I've put the USB port that links my laptop to the dash here in the blanking plate that the AC button would live. Well, I've got the wiring and I've got the display. What I need now is a simple bracket to mount it to the dashboard. But as I'm forced to work with a lunatic, what I've ended up with is this. As usual, Nick's bracket fetish strikes again and I'm left with a beast of a thing to mount my dash to. Actually, the display itself is fairly weighty, so the beefiness of the bracket is probably warranted. Once I've got it bolted to the centre console, I've passed the loom through a hole I drilled in the plastic and it just clicks into the connector. Then it's just a case of popping the assembly back together again in the dashboard. We've lost the audio for some reason, so you'll have to just imagine the bangs and the swearing. Now let's see if this thing powers up okay. What the? I hope the two of you are not concerned about this. Thankfully, the battery cutoff switch put paid to Hal, and to make sure he's gone, I'm doing a factory reset on the system. Right, should we try that again, mate? <sighs> that looks more like it. The display can be configured to show anything that your ECU is monitoring. Here, I've got it set up showing throttle position, inlet air temp, water temp, math, and of course, revs. There's a large selection of different skins and colors to choose from, and every single LED light around the periphery is configurable. This dash is for the rally car, so it has an IVA compliant icons list down the sides for stuff like high beam and hazard warning lights. But I've set those up as shift lights for this car. Okay, so that's lap time and engine parameter monitoring sorted, but we've still done nothing to make it any faster. What I would like to do with the front suspension here is lengthen the bottom arm so we can introduce some negative camber, lower the bottom ball joint so we can mess around with our roll centre, and introduce some sort of adjustable anti-roll bar. 
Unfortunately, we're not allowed to do any of that, so we're stuck with the geometry we've got, which is far from optimal. Now ideally, we'd want to move the bottom ball joint down away from the hub, using a spacer or some fabricated trickery, to make the bottom arm, which even on full droop is currently pointing up to the sky, angle down towards the track. This would help stop the wheel going into positive camber while we're cornering. And it would have the added benefit of raising the roll centre, which would be nice. We did toy with the idea of adding a sort of front strut brace. Now, although the rules say we can't, we came up with the idea of reinforcing the bolt-on steel panel that runs from side to side under the black plastic trim. But as it doesn't bolt directly to the strut tops and we're still forced to use the crappy rubber top mounts, we decided it wasn't worth the hassle. We have come up with a number of ways of increasing the performance of the engine, notwithstanding the sealed ECU, but they stray from the grey areas of interpretation and into downright cheating, and I'm just not comfortable with that. Yet. While the front end takes care of acceleration and direction, the handling characteristics of a front-wheel drive car are very much influenced by the rear axle. And that leaves us really compromised on this car because it was designed as a bit of a shopping trolley rather than a thoroughbred racer. We've got one major issue, and that's bump steer, which leads to droop steer and a positive camber change on the opposite wheel. Yes, really. Allow me to demonstrate. When you corner hard, the outside rear wheel goes into bump and the inside rear wheel droops. We found that on the Citroen, when that happens, the inside rear wheel, as you can see here, goes into toe out. And the outside rear wheel we measured going to toe in. The exact opposite of what you'd want for decent handling. In addition, the camber angle change is quite dramatic too. From a little bit of negative camber to positive camber just by putting the outside wheel into bump. It's now pretty clear why the car likes to understeer. We'll worry about the geometry later. Right now what I want to do is fit an anti-roll bar on the rear to try and sharpen things up. But the rules say we're absolutely not allowed to. So we won't. this isn't is an anti-roll bar, because we're expressly forbidden from fitting one. What it is, we hope, is an adjustable way of increasing the stiffness of the rear axle. We are not allowed to modify the axle, drill it, weld it or anything, but clamping something round it to box in the open section of the V-shaped beam and thereby stiffening it seemed within the rules to us. The cam-shaped flange on the bolt allows us to really get some tension on the straps, and by removing or fitting the outer straps, we can adjust the relative stiffness. Put the rear wheel into bump now and the brace stays flat against the underside of the beam, making it more rigid. You can see that despite the gussets, the brace has got a twist on it, meaning it's working. And if you remove the outer straps, you can see that there's now a gap between the brace and the axle. Theoretically, this should help. So we've tweaked all the things we think we can get away with and some we probably can't, but we haven't been able to successfully fix the rear bump steer. We just can't fix the geometry where we want it over that range of travel. 
It looks like Nick's had an idea with regards to how to control the rear bump steer. And what it looks like is a bit of chain with two bolts welded to it. And that's because it is a bit of chain with two bolts welded to it. The only way we'll know if any of these changes work is to go and test them. So let's do that. Welcome to the terrific Anglesey circuit in Wales. In typical Welsh fashion, it tipped it down overnight and early morning and now it's blowing a gale the like I've rarely seen. Sustained wind speeds of 40 to 50 miles an hour and gusting to well over 60. Perfect testing weather then. All the modifications we've made had to be reversed so the car is in the same state as it was at the end of the race at Cadwell Park. This gives us a baseline to work from as we make changes to the car. I also needed to learn this circuit as it's a new one to me. The wind was drying up the track really quickly and I was beginning to get a bit more confident. The trickiest bit was this very fast right-hander which was exceptionally sketchy until it dried out thoroughly. The setting is stunning. The track is bordered by the sea on the west side. As you come over this crest, all you can see are the waves crashing into the rocks beneath you. It's quite breathtaking. After getting used to the track, the conditions and the scenery, it was back to the pits to begin making some changes. Nick checked both the tyre temperatures and the hot pressures, and our first experiment was to try and get a bit more heat into them by raising the pressures. Nick did his best to get some nice exterior tracking shots while I was out working hard on the circuit, but the howling gale was making it awkward to even hold the tripod up. Still, it got him out in the fresh air and sunshine for a bit, which for a hermit is quite the occasion. I've set the new dash up to give me instant feedback of my current lap time against my best lap time. The 10 LED lights along the top of the display light up red or green depending on whether I'm faster or slower than my best time at any point along the circuit. Each of the lights signifies one tenth of a second. So if three green lights are on, I'm currently three tenths quicker than my best lap and vice versa. It's a very handy tool because it means you can modify your line or change your braking and get instant feedback as to whether it was faster or not. We'd gained some pace by playing with the tyre pressures and now it was time to fit all our new parts to see what they did. We also messed around with the onboard camera to try and get a better view. When we originally set it up we hadn't counted on having to fit a sunstrip that blocked a full third of the windscreen. Still, the Mark II interim bracket is a definite improvement. We tested the roll cage braces and found no difference on track as expected. We tried our not anti-roll bar and we also played with the camber settings just for fun. We ended up with a best lap of 2.029 and here it is. A full lap around the gorgeous Anglesey circuit.
We tested stuff that did work and went faster. We tested stuff that really didn't work and lost time, but we ended up more than two seconds a lap faster than where we started. So the £245 testing fee will be the best value performance upgrade we could have bought. That was a great day's testing and we learned a lot, and I think we've extracted all the performance from the car. Uh, not quite. While our temperature probe was telling us we'd got the rear camber somewhere near, the tyre was telling us something else. We're not running enough rear toe to cause this feathering, which must mean that during hard cornering, we're leaning over and only using this outer half of the tyre. The way to fix that is to run more negative camber. To do that, and yes we are allowed to do it, you slacken off the four bolts that hold the wheel bearing and the brake backing plate to the axle, remove the shims that we already put in, and then add a washer of indeterminate thickness in between the backing plate and the axle in the lower two holes. This tilts the whole assembly, and therefore the wheel, out at the bottom and in at the top, giving us negative camber. The level makes the noise when it's horizontal, and then you can see how much the top of the wheel tilts in as I move the frame to touch the rim. Could probably stand to run a bit more, but we'll leave it there for now. I queried the need to take the weight box for a ride if we don't need ballast, and was told we could remove it. Ace. We unexpectedly had more time than we'd anticipated before the next race, so took the opportunity to tidy a few things up. We got rid of those crappy zinced cap heads in the radio plate, painted the standoff bracket, and added some lightness with real fake carbon fibre effect vinyl. There's a new dead pedal to rest my clutch foot on, complete with a bit of 40 grit wet and dry glued to the surface for extra grip. We've added more carbon fibre vinyl, this time to the cage where I get in and out and scuff the powder coating. Nick made a couple of end plates for the dashboard to tidy up that gipping gash we had to cut into it to get round the cage legs. They're covered in carbon fibre, obvs. I made a new cowl for the display to hide the wiring behind it and to cut down the possibility of it glaring on the windscreen. We fitted a new wide-angle rear-view mirror. The OEM version was pants. We wrapped the cage in self-adhesive high-density foam in the places where I might crack my helmet on getting in and out. No one wants a scratched helmet. We repurposed an old bit of ratchet strap into a door handle, using a couple of riv nuts to secure it. The power for the in-car camera is now routed how we originally wanted, since getting a longer cable and a nice flush-fitting power adapter. And last but not least, we have a beautiful new camera bracket that's adjustable, rigid and short of rolling the car into a ball of snot, the camera shouldn't fall off. Well that really is all we can do, so join us next week for Race 2.